Wait for it, wait for it, <laughs> and we're live. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans and one absentee chaos coordinator geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in in dysfunction. So without further ado, we're going to let our guest, Mr. John Holland, introduce himself to our listeners and viewers. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm a comic book writer. I've been writing comics probably since the mid-80s. I've worked for Innovation, Fanagraphics, uh, Malibu, Kitchen Sink, uh, a lot of uh, the indie publishers at that time. Uh, I'm Mostly self-publishing now, but I am working with some publishers. I've worked with, I've done some stuff with Antarctica. It's a live comics, uh, and I'm always open to working with other publishers. Uh, mainly self-publishing now. Uh, last year, I ended up self-publishing. I think almost a dozen comics. Uh, wow. You know, some of them are reprints of some stuff I did, but also a lot of stuff, new things. And uh, I've got a new new issue, a new comic coming out on Kickstarter, Death Rain. Gihana uh, coming out on Kickstarter this month. It's actually live on Kickstarter right now. And that's pretty much sums it up, I think. <laughs> if you released uh, 12 books last year, does that mean you have multiple artists? Because otherwise, holy crap. Oh, yes. I have a lot of different artists. Yeah, like, I use quite a few different. Now, some of those I released last year were reprints of some of the earlier work I had did back in the uh, 80s. Uh, okay. But even that, I've st I use uh, probably I'm working with about four or five artists on a, at least a semi regular basis. Okay. All right, Nick, and, you had uh, a question. Yeah, for you wrote you said you wrote for Malibu, which yeah, I did. Uh, I did the uh, adaptation of the Death World novels, Harry Harrison's Death World novels. Yeah, I adapted them to comic book form. It was. It's Malibu, but it was actually their adventure line. They, you know, Malibu okay. at that time was doing a lot of different. They had Eternity Adventure and a lot of different, uh, uh, different uh, imprints. And I adapted right. it. Uh, each one was like four issue miniseries for uh, their adventure comics. Yeah, see, I didn't get into Malibu until like they took on Image as their publisher, and then I was like, man, these are really cool books. And then I did a little deep dive into before. Um, image showed up and yeah, they had some really interesting properties and different oh. little uh, things going on there. Yeah. Malibu was uh, one of the, I think, you know, at the time that was kind of like what they call the black and white boom when like everybody was publishing black and white comics and Malibu was one of the, the, the few that actually came out of that, you know, fairly well. A lot of them just fell by the wayside because a lot of stuff, they were publishing anything. They were throwing anything they could up against the wall to see what got pop, you know, would stick. And uh, Malibu yeah. did a, they had like three or four different, they had Eternity, uh, Adventure Comics, and a few other different lines. And then they, I think they moved, con combined everything into just Malibu eventually. And then uh, then they picked up Image for that month or two. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was really cool stuff. I mean, what an exciting time in comics. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff. They published, I think they, they were the ones that published... Uh, Planet of the Apes, and they did a lot of adaptations of a lot of different uh, science fiction work and uh, TV stuff. Yeah, they're like the IDW before IDW was a thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> like they're I they I think they had like a Sherlock Holmes one. They had a bunch of stuff going on. These like other IPs that were up for grabs. Yeah, and they were, yeah. they were anything really they smart could come up with. Yeah, I mean they did. Uh, also, they did Stainless Steel Rat, which was probably Harry Harrison's better known work. Uh, yeah. you know, and then they, like I said, I did the three issues. They, he did three death world novels and, uh, I did the three issues of that. And I've got the first issue I've still got in print because that's public domain. So I can kind of keep that yeah. in print still. Uh, so I, I do, I collected that into a trade and I still do, I still sell that at cons and stuff. Nice. Yeah. That's, that's real impressive stuff. All right. Next question. Question. All right, now that we got that out of the way and they nerded out over their bromance of comic book glory days, we're going to ask yeah. him a religion question and see if he gets to stick around. Although, it sounds like Nick's already decided yes. But <laughs> I'm on the fence. We'll see how these questions go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got the formalities so regardless. It's looking good. Right. <laughs> Not Wars. too much writing on this. <laughs> Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Firefly. Excellent answer. Why? 
I, I almost said Star Wars, but I don't know. Firefly just appeals to me more. I I I, I like Nathan Fillion. I I like the character he played in the in the uh, show. Um, I wasn't like I didn't pick up on it right away. I, I just I when it first came out, I think I missed the first few episodes, and then I finally went to watch it, which is kind of strange because I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. You know, so I was a big you know, but I I didn't jump on the Firefly right away. It took me a I think it was a few issues in before I started watching it. And then once, once I did, I loved it. It's better late than never. It was years until I got introduced to Firefly. And then I watched it. I was like, the buddy lent it to me. I was like, hey, man, you got second season? He's like, oh, sweet child. There's yeah. no second season. <laughs> I think like, that, could have, that, that could have ended up being better than Buffy. And and that's for, for me, that's a lot to say because I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. And I think Firefly could have ended up being better than that yeah okay yeah, I think you're right. and because we are polytheistic here at the blasters and blades podcast the game of thrones wheel of time or chronicles of narnia maybe game of thrones you're talking about the movie the tv show or the books dealer's choice we picked ones that had all three okay well either actually books and tv show the beginning of each of them I, I read the books before the TV show came out, and I, I think by the last second two books he wrote, I started losing interest in it. And kind of like in the TV show, I, I you know, as a guy, especially the last season, just you know, I think fell apart. So uh, kind of you know, the first half of both I really enjoyed, and then it just I started losing interest in it. I, it was either the very last book he's written or the one before that I really did not like. It's been so long, I can't even tell you what they were about. But uh, it's, I don't know what it was. The first few books he, of, the, of the series were, were great, and I, I couldn't wait to read them. But, and then the same with the TV show. I think, you know, he, it started losing it as it went on. And especially the last season was just, I thought it was terrible. Yeah. By, by season six, I was like, I think I was just watching it out of habit at that point. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It, it was kind of like lost, you know, it was like, at the beginning, Game of Thrones was like one of those shows that I had to watch. You know, it was like so good. And Lost was like that when it first came out. And then by the time Lost ended, I was like, they just, it was terrible, I thought. I think Lost is one of those shows where they didn't really know where it was going. They were lost too. And yes. they were just riding the mystery. And at first that's fun because you're like, man, it's like we don't know what's going to happen next. Flash, you know, news flash. They didn't either. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's bad in a mystery if you don't know where it's going to go. Yeah, it's and bad they all kept saying too. that they they knew where it was going. You know, they kept saying, "Oh yeah, we have it all planned out," and and you could tell it wasn't planned out. They just at the end, it was just so bad. Yep. All right, Nick, you you got your your superhero one today. All right, so, so to your people. That's right. Favorite dark hero. Uh, your choices are Spawn, The Darkness, or Batman. That's going to be a tough one. I have to admit, I've never read The Darkness. Even though when you start looking at the art for uh, Death Rain, it's very inspired by The Darkness. <laughs> but the, our artist is very, you know, he loved those books when they first came out. Spawn, I, I, I probably read the first 50 issues of Spawn and I really enjoyed. And Batman, I like off and on. You know, like I... It, I know it's a lot of people did not like it, but I enjoy Tom King's version of Batman. I was I was a big fan of Tom King, uh, but you know, and I've read him often on other other writers have did it, but you know, it just it depends on I guess who's writing it if I like Batman or not. I think yeah, Batman I think, is over us. You know, it's everywhere. It's just yeah, I just there's can't get into too much lore. Yeah. yeah. I think Scott Snyder did the best version of it with uh, the Court of Owls because that was something new that had not yeah, been. Yeah, that was pretty really – I did enjoy years. that. But uh, I know Tom King – a lot of people really don't like Tom King's version of it. But I kind of like Tom King's version because he – and this is kind of getting away from the dark character, but he actually made Batman smile once in a while. He kind of made Batman a little more human. And, and, and that's why I wasn't a fan. It's like because he's dark and brooding and dealing with childhood trauma. You know, yeah, you and I think that's why most people mind. didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, like his run on Superman wasn't all that great either. Um, but Tom's written some really good stuff other than those two properties. And I was, yeah. like, I was really hopeful when I read those. And I got like maybe two issues in. I'm like, <laughs> that ain't Batman. That ain't Superman with that. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. Now this is the most important question, but sir, are you ready? Yes, sir. Favorite dinosaur. All right. This is one I want. I, I'm going to wonder how many people picked a stegosaurus. Almost everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it <was> awesome. <laughs> Stegosaurus, Triceratops, and Pterodactyls are the popular choices. Oh, I should have went with Tyrannosaurus no, Rex. <laughs> that was, yeah. Paulo went okay. with that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, well, they're going to they're gonna see this episode first, actually. So, <laughs> All right, then tomorrow. Uh, uh, the, the fourth version, or the fourth answer that was most common was the uh, Brachiosaur. The long neck yeah. dudes. The long necks, because of uh, Land oh. Before Time. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Okay. All right. And because we are civilized human beings and are no longer knuckle dragging troglodytes, coffee or tea? And how do you take it? Tea, milk, and sugar. Okay. What type of tea? Earl Grey? Actually, I've been experimenting. I've been buying like those uh, boxes of tea you get like, you know, all around the world. Yeah. And stuff. The variety and packs. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. Awesome. And, uh, I've been drinking a lot of tea, you know, for a while I, I kind of got away from it, but the last year or so it's like, I drink a lot of tea every day and it's, I just pick a different one and just try it out. So do you do the, the press Lipton style bag or are you going for the more free form? That's almost like drinking tea in the raw where you get more of the benefits from it. No, nah, I'm, I'm, I use the bags. Well, there are the newer bags that are popular. So the Lipton tea bag, it's pressed like cottony material or whatever that's made out of. And, and those, any benefit the tea had, you've lost. I mean, you might get some of the flavor, but that's it. The new bags where they're like the, almost the see-through mesh where you can see like the raw leaves inside, that's actually you're still getting a lot of the benefits from the nutrients of the tea. Um, the, the only thing better than that is if you have the, the leaves raw in the little container that you can get. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I've a little actually, guy. I've actually started drinking, and I, and I didn't really realize what I was buying, but uh, some of the – like the ones with the mesh that I've been drinking some. So the reason I learned about this is they overdosed us in cortisone to keep us in the field when I was in Iraq in the early days. And then the VA said, well, the army doctor was giving it to you. Let me just keep giving it to you. So I was getting biweekly or no, two times a week shot one in each knee of cortisone. And then they said, Oh, this is probably too much. So the second year they did every other week. And, uh, Eventually, I realized, hey, this is probably more than I was supposed to take in an entire lifetime. So I went to my doctor about it, and he said they did what? And so long story short, he encouraged me to look at teas because a lot of, you know, before pharmaceuticals existed, we still had medicines in the form of Mother Nature. And so, like, if I'm having a cold, like peppermint tea and honey, and I'll fight a cold like nothing for me. So I started learning about all the benefits of tea, and I realized how much of that we lost when we let Lipton's smush it into that whatever. <laughs> so when you drink it more in the raw, you get a lot of the benefits. The same thing with honey. Local, it's got to be local honey to get the benefits, though, and, and less processed. So I, I generally have a new rule since I've been trying to be healthier is if I can't pronounce what's in it, I just don't buy it. It's a good rule. That's probably a good rule, yeah, which means I probably have to give up half my food, though. I mean – I make exceptions for some things because, you know, like I, when I get my pizza from the frozen food section, Red Baron, I know I'm killing my calories with that meal. And I'm OK with that. I know not to look too deeply because I'm not pretending that it's healthy. It's so just buy, the shells and cheese, man. That's that's my go to comfort food. So if I can yeah. put that in a dinner, some like mac and cheese with Velveeta shells and cheese, that's my favorite. So we'll do the homemade chili and then we'll mix it with that. And then everybody's butt stinks for like a week. <laughs> All right. So, so this is an important question for you too, John, since you, are you from the South? It sounds like. Oh yeah. I lived, I've, my, my dad was in the, uh, the Navy. So we moved around a bit, but it's always been in the South for like, I think one year long enough for my brother to be born. We lived in New Jersey. But besides that, it's been like Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana. So this is an important question then because the, the great mac and cheese debate. So runny and cheesy or more casserole style? I'm, I'm team casserole. What about you two? I, I like casserole better. Okay, Nick, you're the I'm runny guy. Right I'm the runny guy, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. It's I just said Velveeta shells and cheese. I mean, you can't casserole that. Oh, I, I like it when it's more casserole. And then when they do the bread crumbles on top of it, which totally well, kills any a, diet value, but it's still a worth uh, it. For I say casserole, but if, when I cook it, I probably cook it more the runny style just because it's easier. 
Yeah. yeah. Like I dip my chicken in it. Like so do you yeah, get odd? You go chicken. with the macaroni noodles or do you you go wide with the, some of the other penne or other things people experiment with? Uh probably noodles. Just regular. I had one guy that I served the army with was a heathen. He used spaghetti noodles because he swore it made it taste better. And, and oh. both the, the southerner in me and, and the Italian in the unit were like, no, you, you're you're out of the army. We're just we're done with you. It's, <laughs> it's heresy cannot stand. He tried to convince us it was better with with spaghetti noodles. But Ooh. come to think of it, we hadn't heard from him in a while. Anyway, no correlation, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Completely unrelated. Completely unrelated. All right, so obviously we're here for your comic book Kickstarter, and we're going to show the art in a little bit and start talking about it. But what got you into comics to start with? Because you didn't just start one day and wake up and be like, hey, I'm going to write comic books. I'm guessing. You probably read them first, right? Yeah, I've been reading comics since – well, I've been reading since I was uh, at least probably five years old or something. I was like – when I was a little kid, my, my parents uh, enrolled me in like a Dr. Zeus uh, – book club so i every every other month i'd get a dr zeus book and uh, i can't remember not reading so you know i started reading books and comics probably about the same time so i've been reading comics forever and you know and i was reading you know when i was younger i was reading like a lot of science fiction and it was like a you know like isaac asimov uh robert silverberg one of my favorite writers is harlan ellison and uh you know, Harlan's not well known as well known today as he was back in the 60s and 70s. But uh, he was more of a science of short story writer. And in his okay. short story collections. And he'd always have an introduction to the stories. And sometimes the introductions were as good or better than the stories. Almost he would talk about whatever was happening in his life or how he wrote the story or it just it gave such a behind the scenes look and a writer and Asimov used to do that too in a short story collection. Yeah. He would talk about what was going on. And that just, I think that's what got me into like, Oh, I want to be a writer. I want to write. And, uh, you know, and, and I liked comics. I used to try to write, you know, stories, short stories too, and comics at the same time. But, you know, I think I had a little more re uh, success in the comics. So I kind of stopped writing, you know, trying to write the short stories so much. Yeah. And, uh, just kept, you know, concentrating on the comics more and more. And uh, until I started selling some stuff, you know, until, you know, and then I started selling a few things and just, you know, that kind of went on from there. Now, is that something you, um, the introduction or the, uh, the prologue, uh, is that something you put into your comics as well? A little like what's going on with you? In yes. The world? Yeah. All my self-published comics, like when you open the comic on the inside front of the comic is always... Mm -hmm something about the comic or maybe what was going on in my life at that time, or just, you know, some, some behind the scenes stuff. Cause I've always liked that. One of the comics I really enjoyed too was Cerebus and uh, Dave Sim used to do that a lot. He'd always in his front yeah. on the front of the inside cover. He'd always talk about, you know, what was going on in his life, things like that. And uh, I just feel like the com when I self publish a comic, I want as much information or as much in each issue as I can get. So, you know, the, the comics are usually 24 page. Sometimes I don't know, self publishing my own comics. I try their minimum. They're 24 pages, but I've been writing a comic before. And I realized when I get to page 20, I'm like, well, I'm not going to finish this in four pages, you know? So it right. may end up being 28 pages or there is one comic. I that end up being 36 pages or sometimes I get to a point where I just, I realize I need to make it another issue and, you know, I'll do another 24 pages. And that's the nice thing about being self published. You know, I can write it, you know, it can be a second issue, third issue, or it can be as long as I want it to be. If I get to yeah. the point where it's going to be more than 36 pages, I figured that would that needs to be split into another book. Right. Uh, there was, when I was first starting out making my own comics, um, I did the first issue was like 24 pages. And I was like, man, that took forever. And then it was 22 pages on the second issue. And then I did it like two issues where they were like 16 pages. I did like a 16 page story. Yeah. Um, and then, so that brought me up to issue four and then five and six. I was like, Oh man, I feel guilty charging people $5 a, for a floppy. And there's only 16 pages in the damn thing. So I'm like, Oh, okay. And then I went back to the 24 page. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the reasons I do at least, I, cause you know, I think, and I, I haven't really 
counted a Marvel or DC lately, but a lot of Marvel, you know, the, the big imprints, I think they're only like 20 or 22 pages. And I could be yeah, wrong. Then, no, and you're right. Then, and then they throw a bunch of ads in there. Yeah. And that's why I decided, you know, I want to at least do 24 pages. You know, I want to do a little bit more than that. And, you know, and, and have the reader feel like they're getting something. Cause you know, like you said, it's $5 an issue. You know, I can't really charge less than $5 and make any type of money, you know? Right. Uh, and as, as it is, that's like, you know, I always tell people when I'm, when I do a convention, you know, by the time you add in, you know, table costs, hotel costs, gas, you know, it takes a lot of $5 comics to make that up. You oh, yeah. A lot of comics. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, they're long days. <laughs> yes. Very long. So you days. can break even. Yes. Very long day. That's why I've started selling t-shirts and a few other things just to kind of offset that, that cost because I don't know how many conventions I've done and I never made money, you know, made a pro probably the majority of my conventions. I probably walked away not making a profit. <laughs> oh, um, I'm like the only guy that didn't make any money at dragon con because, <laughs> um, they put a, a curtain around the escalator to the fourth floor. And that's where they put all of artists alley. So even George Perez didn't make money on that one. Oh, wow. You know? He was walking around bored, just, you know, talking to all the other, all the artists. And, you know, I just see a bald guy with a goatee and glasses and a Hawaiian shirt. And I'm like, I know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 that's one of my fond memories of that. I mean, I took like a $1,200 bath on that con, but it, the experience, just being able to talk to some of these other artists, especially George Perez, so you know, was a lot of the, um, a lot of the comic book guys that we've talked to you uh, included, Something about those Hawaiian five O shirts, man. Is it like a required uniform they issue you at comic book school? Uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, I've got a couple of them in my closet. <laughs> Same. Um, I I went the other route though. Even though I do have the standard issue comic book Hawaiian shirt, uh, I started going with bowling <laughs> shirts. Oh, bowling okay. Shirt and slacks. It was very uh, very Matthew Perry from Friends. So I'd have my my bowling shirt, my khakis, and then my vans, and then that that was that was my uniform. That's what I was trying to get known for. So like, oh, okay, that, I know Nick Garber because that's what he wears. Yeah. Now my uniform. Now I, I I do enough of my own shirts that I try to wear like you know something with one of my characters or a logo like this one. You know, die bold. You know, while I'm at a convention, so it makes it easier for me yeah. to dress too. I don't have to think too hard. I just have to pick yeah. one of the shirts. Yeah, I, I do the same thing now, too, because I was, like, tired of picking outfits. So I got, like, four or five character shirts and one company shirt with, yeah. with the company logo on it and a, and a hoodie. I'm a big fan of hoodies. Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah, but I have a hoodie so with, my, uh, with my skull logo. I have a the, the skull. I've got a skull that's kind of like the logo for the uh, the company, and I've got a hoodie for that, too. So, yeah. That's brilliant. Do you guys sell Hawaiian shirts as part of your branding? Because, I mean – if we're going to buy Hawaiian shirts, why not buy from our friends? No, but that's, that's something I may look into now. <laughs> okay. I, I don't quite have the beard and mustache for the, for the Hawaiian five, Hawaii five Oh look, but, but I have goals. <laughs> it's good to have goals, man. <laughs> no, I think you can pull it off. I've, I've seen your face. I think with the current beard, you could totally rock the, uh, the Hawaiian shirt. I'm, I'm, I've got to, I got to start small. So, you know, maybe I'll start with the bowling shirt. Uh, I mean, if you put the bumpers on, I'm, I'm a king at bowling. Same. I'll whoop the crap out of a nine-year-old with the bumpers on. All right. So while we're talking about his comic, let me show some of the art so you can see. Uh, it, it's rather dark, but I like it. Now, that's actually one of the variant covers. That's by our colorist, Jave Lapar. He actually drew that cover, and he did an awesome job with it. Okay, I yeah, stole all the cool. art. I stole all of the art that we're sharing, dear listener at home. Uh, this is all from the Kickstarter page, so you guys can see it too. It's nothing that's that's um, not available to the public, but but I really dig it. What do you think, Nick? No, I think it's well done. It's a, it's a classic um, layout. Um, it's one that always sells. So you take a one of your heroes or even your villains and you put them on a throne and you kind of put them, in, you know, in this very confident pose that he's in right now. Trying to recreate it, like I have the the chair here, but uh, it's a good contrast between light and dark. Um, it's pretty close to realism, photorealism. Um, the glowing eyes is just draws your your eye right to it. So 
it is it is a masterfully done cover. Go scroll down. There's something that I missed. Okay, skulls. Love skulls. Love when you're skulls? sitting on the throne of skulls. Or is it spirits. souls or the souls of the undead? Because it looks right. almost like ghoul souls. Yeah, Ghouls. they should be skulls. You'll see a lot of skulls in, the, I think, the artwork. Uh, that's cool. And then, and then was that a cape that he's got? Scroll up a little yes. bit or zoom out. Okay, so yeah, I love that Spanish type um, display of the cape. You know, because that was one of the things I loved about Spawn is that he had that big flowy cape that just looked like it was out of control, but he had some. He still kind of like made it seem like he was controlling it somehow. So it's just it was a cool aesthetic for that character, and I think it works well for this cover. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's exactly the 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 image or the look we were trying for was that spawn cape. Yeah. Look at this logo, Nick. How cool is that? That that's pretty awesome. That's the kind of thing I'll, people get tattooed. I mean, that is that yeah. is badass. I'll yeah. tell you, that logo has gotten more response. People love that logo so much. And when we the, the guy that uh created the logo, his name's Phil Woodward. And when we we when we asked him to create the logo we kind of said we were looking for like a uh 80s heavy metal type that's the vibe i was getting i was gonna ask that that was one of my questions <laughs> I, that was gonna be my follow-up is like it screams metal i was a pantera guy yeah Metallica, he, did, Megadeth. he did such an awesome job on that logo we couldn't have asked for a better that logo just like i said people just see that logo and love it now that's one of the things with that logo on for. It? I just made shirts for that logo, so I'm hoping that sells real well. Is it on a T-shirt currently? Yes. Okay, I'm buying it. Yeah, I was going to wear one, and then I forgot. I didn't. I forgot about it, but I should have. Um... I mean, I like this. This looks very classic '80s art. Now this it's giving this me is, very uh, heavy metal vibes. Yeah, I'm still uh, digging it. The artist Travis Smith is did the pencils for this, and then we got Brian LeBlanc. Do, did actually painted it so uh oh you got leblanc on this nice yeah yeah and he did an awesome job we were coming up shorthanded like right before the kickstarter because we offered this cover the virgin cover of this was a, a like a early bird 24 hour special and uh Ooh. he painted this for us in like two days to get Man, us to, to make sure we got our deadline and he did an awesome job on that cover it, that would make an awesome print too. That's like something that I would frame and hang in my office. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. This is the kind of thing you put as a poster on your man cave wall. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's something we we, we need to look at. We haven't thought about that yet, but that that would make a great poster. Like a stretch goal, make it uh, okay. Yeah, you know, for everybody that got this mount, you know, we're in the stretch goal here. You get this eight by ten or whatever, yeah. one by seventeen print. That yeah, hell yeah. This like yeah. looks like some post apoc TTRPG vibe. Like I could see, you know, playing that adventure. Yeah, it's de it's definitely got a tabletop role playing game going on with it, um, which is going to increase your audience because people are going to look at that and they're into comics already, and they're like, "Oh, wait a minute, this kind of looks like an RPG game." And then this is the art. I really like this one. It's it's dark and bright at the same time. Yeah. Now that's that's Travis's art for the. That's actually a panel from inside the comic, and that's Jericho yeah. Black. That's definitely the darkness vibe that you were talking about yes. earlier. <laughs> and then I'm just going to go. So obviously they got the logo, which is, like I said, we, we really like. I like the barbed yeah, wire that you just now notice when you got it solo, like the barbed wire almost wrapped around the, the circle. It uh, One of my favorite uh, horror movie production companies is um, Twisted Pictures, and they got barbed wire wrapped all around their logo. Reminds me of that. So, like, you're hitting all the – if there's a lot more people like me, and I'm sure there are, because there's a big correlation between metalheads and comic books, yeah, and horror, you're this. This thing's gonna that's, fun next week. That's what we're trying. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, and these pencils right here are beautiful. Yeah, that's that's. I like it. I mean, like I don't know what that monster is, but I wouldn't want to that, fight him in a dark alley. That's actually one of the good guys. That's Steve, the death, uh, death machine, the death machine of the apocalypse. Right. Okay. So he's I wouldn't want to guys. run into him in a well lit daytime area. And <laughs> uh, then this is looks like one of the covers that was listed. Yeah, that's one of the variant covers. That's uh by Hernan Gonzalez. Uh and he did that variant for us. And that's Allison, who's one of the uh one of the other the three main good guys is Jericho Black, Allison, and Steve. 
Dang it, Steve. Damn it, Steve. <laughs> yeah. All right. I like this one. This is some of the art we already saw, but this is the rest of the panel. And I, I'm digging it. It, it kind of looks like, I don't know, the Walking Dead vibe as far as the art style to me. I'm not an artiste like Nick, but if you, if you colored it, I, I, I'm digging it. Now, that's a two-page uh, spread. That's going to be this, uh, page two and three. So that's a two-page spread in the comic. Oh, wow. Oh, Did I do okay in my art analysis, Nick? Do I get to keep my day job? Yeah, yeah, you're not fired yet. Not that I can fire you. You're the one. You're you're in charge of this show. I work for you. <laughs> All right, but I, I really like I really like the art. I like the the gore, but it's not overdone. Yeah, it's not a gratuitous. It 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 fits the story from what I'm seeing, and that's that's what you want. Um, I like the creatures. I don't know if they're demons or whatever they are, but they're scary. And yeah, we're calling we're calling them demons. So, yeah, I saw the spelling for you. You spelled it with a D A E. Yeah. Okay. It's just an older version, I think, of of the spelling of demons. I just thought it kind of gave yeah. it a little, maybe a classic look to it or spelling to it, just a little different. Yeah, it's very um, old world. And then this is some more of the art. This obviously um, talks about the the Kickstarter, but we're going to do that in just a second. But look at the the bridge scene. With all the monsters behind them, like in the open maws, I like that. Here's what I'm digging. This is Travis too, right? Yes, that's Travis. Okay, so what I'm liking about Travis' work on this, from what I'm seeing, is that even when it's center framed, which is a big no-no in comics, this he he moves the camera. He moves the yeah. camera to a point where it becomes interesting. So you got these two back, like I'm pointing at the screen, like people can see my fingers. <laughs> what a dork I am. But uh, the, I like how he, he tilted the camera and it's just left of center frame. So it adds tension. And then you got like everything going on behind the, these two, three characters, you know, just, just bad news. And all he's got is a bat. So I feel for this dude. And then we get to that bottom panel and yeah, they're center framed, but the background is kind of, shifted again to the left, which adds, adds tension on that bridge. And then to make it even more tense, you got these two creatures that are eating up the left and right side and coming right at these guys. So it's Travis did a brilliant job on this. All right. And if you are listening at home, this is uh, on the audio only. I, I would highly recommend you click the link to the Kickstarter. So that way you can look at the art because that's where all the art we're looking at comes from. Um, and we appreciate you sticking through that commercial interlude. Those of you that are watching on the YouTubes, the bit shoots and the rumbles, you didn't get a commercial break because John graciously sponsored this episode. So we get to keep talking about this pretty cool comic. Um, yeah. all right. this is the, um, I don't know. It's like the badass female kind of gives me Xena vibes, but not quite uh, that, that big ass ax in the back. I'm digging it. I'm glad you said ass. I was like, we can't see her ass. <laughs> I have an imagination, Nick. I'm not dead. <laughs> it's very cyber force. Um, yeah. Along with that's, you know, that's where, the, you know, the, yeah, that's another, you know, influence where he had from it. Uh, and that's Travis's art again. Travis was obviously a fan of early image. Yes. Cause it, it, it's coming out like, Cyber Force, Spawn, the darkness, you know. And yeah, and that's that's what we're trying for that vibe, that that image and that early nineties vibe, you know, the whole yeah. you know, between the 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 comic and you know, just the art and everything. I think he nailed it, and I would probably ask this girl for dinner if I was still single. I don't care <laughs> about cybernetic attachments. I'm into that. <laughs> I like this one more. This is the one that spoke to me the most, especially with the, like the floating heads. Yeah, now that's Travis's. That's the the uh, the cover to the first I the issue, and it's a double double spread. So you can see where it'll yeah. go split down the middle, and this is the front cover, and that's going to be the back cover. It's so when we're, when we're looking at this, would you say it's a post-apocalyptic setting then? Very much so. I mean, on the scale of zero to Judge Dread, where would you say it fits? Uh, I would say probably. A ten. Okay. But All you right. know, it's 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 actually not on Earth, but it's in that same situation. Okay. And then another bridge scene. I mean, just look at this right here with just the skeletons on the on this the bridges like that. Very fallout look to me. And uh, I'm guessing this is a wolfman. Uh just another demon. It could be a wolfman demon. 
Yeah. And then this, this is the one we looked at earlier, but just the details. I'm can, can super you, impressed. Can you go back to the other cover? Details. Can you go back to the uh, one we just looked? If you look at, yeah, that one, if you look at this in the, the, the city behind them, you can see the buildings are actually almost coming alive. You can see mouths on the buildings. Oh, yeah. yeah. And eyes and stuff. So. Okay. That's pretty neat. And then if you see the logo up there too, one of the things I like about the logo is it it's it's easy to like it doesn't take cover the art because it's you know because it's not so big it doesn't like spread out you know most logos would cover that whole like I'm doing what you did trying to point it <laughs> you know most logos would cover the whole top of the artwork and so this logo kind of just fits in a corner somewhere where you know it it I like the logo but it doesn't you know cover the art at the same time yeah and you, this is how you can tell that your artist is worth his weight in salt. Um, he left that space there, you know, he didn't crowd the page so much where you're trying to figure out where the hell am I going to put this logo? Where I'm going to put this yeah. logo type and masthead and all that. So he brilliantly executed this cover and left you a place where you could stick that cover, that, uh, logo. And it's not going to cover this beautiful art, you know, even the, even the buildings are really good. They're really well done, highly detailed. So yeah, I thank God he left that space. Cause I would just. It would this be a would shame make, to cover that stuff. This yeah. would make one heck of a like a screensaver on your background of your computer. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. There's so much you could do with that artwork. But yeah, back a wallpaper, that's definitely yeah. one of them. So we've obviously we don't want to give everything away. So we limited it to the art that we could see on the Kickstarter. If you want to see more of the art from this, you're gonna have to back it and buy it because that's how books work. You don't get to read them for free unless they're at the library and then the library paid for them. So it's still not stealing. Um, but what can you tell us about the, the world where this story takes place? You said it's not earth. No, it's not earth. It's, it's a planet called uh, Guiana. Uh, and it, it's, it's kind of a planet where anything can happen. Uh, reality does it, the reality doesn't have a very strong hold in this planet. It's, uh, you can walk from, I don't know if anybody have, has either of you read Jack Chalker's well world series? No, I have not. Okay. So it basically in the, on this planet, it's like, you could be in one spot where like they're at right now and it's demons, it's full of demons and, and monsters. And you, you, you keep walking and maybe like if you got into a, what would be another country or another city, it may be full of vampires. And if you keep walking, you could be into a section that maybe time doesn't exist like normal. So reality is like up for grabs in this world. And, and there's nothing, you know, there's, there's not like it, the whole planet's not full of demons. It's demons, vampires, all sorts of stuff as you go along. And it's, as, as we show things, we can like basically take almost anything we can think of that's going to affect into this world. So are the main characters all from this world or is it earthlings that get sort of sent there? That's part of the mystery, but, uh, you know, like Jericho Black is the main character and he has some connections to Earth that, you know, we're going to explore and not really like, you know, tell everybody right away. Uh, you know, the Allison, who is uh, the, the female character is actually she was like part of the demon, the demon horde before. And now she's become, you know, on the side of good and she's trying to atone for her past. And then oh. Steve is just a creature that was created to basically destroy the world. And he's, he's kind of trying to reform himself and, you know, and help people. I like the uh, redemption arc story. It allows you to have the, the darkness that some people like the grim dark worlds, but give you that light at the end of the tunnel. That isn't just the train rushing to kill you. Yeah. All of them are going to have their, their kind of their redemption, you know, uh, you know, Jericho is like looking, you know, trying to save, you know, his soul by helping people. Allison is just trying to atone, you know, for her soul, you know, for or redeem her soul. And then Steve is just trying to prove he has a soul. <laughs> I'm a sucker for a second chance story. So I'm, I'm here for it. I like it. So what so is so the. What, I'm so, what happens here is. It, the, there is a strong connection to Earth because. On this planet, cities from Earth are just appearing on this planet. And this is a city that was, all these buildings behind them were was, was a city before from Earth. 
when they come to earth they just transfer into the these crazy building you know to eat people and stuff like that and then the demons on this planet there's going to be some you know a bad you know a head bad guy demon and some lieutenant demons they're basically trying to kill all the humans they hate the humans and the our three good guys are there to you know save the humans okay so what is the general plot arc of this this story this comic for book one, because obviously there's going to be follow-on books, but but what what's the this kind of the summary of the story without spoilers of this 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 book? The the first issue is you know introducing the characters and you know and and you know connect seeing giving some mystery behind them, seeing who they are, and uh, it's setting up the the showing where the humans are coming and where the humans they're they're trying to take the humans from the the cities and there's like a, a sanctuary on the planet that they're trying to get them to and just basically you know that first issue is just showing a lot of that fight and a lot of that 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 arc of you know their their redemption uh showing where it is and showing a lot more of Jericho's connection to earth because he has a connection to the to the earth okay yeah so what Oh, I'm sorry. I gotta go. I gotta. Uh, my sister is having a seizure. All right. All right. So, Nick, do we want to keep this going or see if he comes back? All right. Flip. Uh, uh, we can. All right. Well, so obviously, can, um, let, let's let's wrap harder. <laughs> let's wrap this up. And uh, and what we will say is, uh, it looks interesting. We definitely want to back it. Um, it is. Uh, intriguing. The the author seems heck of a decent guy. Um, I would definitely read this if it was in novel form. You know, I don't tend to do the picture books. Partly, I think, you know, being colorblind, I don't see a lot of the details you do. But yeah. <clears throat> the plot itself definitely intrigued me. I mean, I would read novels written in this world. So They do have an option for a, uh, they call it an unwrapped, which in the comic book world, that means it's just the pencils. Oh, with the so Captions and stuff like that. So it. So there are options I for think, colorblind folks like me. Th there cool. are options for colorblind folks. That's uh, it's one of the things I wanted to do with my own company, and uh, well, I'll probably do that in the future. But I saw that option. Uh, I wanted the color, so I backed it. Um, and you know me, I'm pretty tight with my money, so I only back good stuff. So it looks good, and I would love to do a review on it later, either either here on the Blasters Blades or on my own channels. So we're we're sorry. Obviously, life happens sometimes. Um, so uh, you know, got to handle family emergencies when they come. So you know, that's just that's just the the nature of the beast. And we appreciate you guys being understanding. Um, I will link to all of John's show no, uh, social medias in the show notes, and I will link to the Kickstarter so you can back it. And uh, yeah, it's it, it sounds pretty awesome. I mean, I don't know how much more we had to say other than that. So with that being said. Um, just remember, please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. And that includes comics. Um, and we are still looking to see if there are any sites out there that allow us for comic reviews. But in the meantime, start a blog, review the comics. You'll be popular. Who knows? They might even send you free stuff just so you'll review it too. Post it on Facebook. There you go. And if you do write comic reviews, uh, hook us up and, um, you know, Nick would love to see them, share them. Maybe you can have an episode where you get nerdy about it because uh, we are trying to do more comic book content for the, uh, for the podcast. Um, Come on, help me out so I can have a job yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you could find us on our link tree, L I N K T R dot E E link tree slash blasters and blades podcast. Again, link tree slash blasters and blades podcast, where we link to all the things, the bit shoots, the rumbles, the YouTubes, the Twitters, our email for professional purposes, only blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. We link to our Facebook group and Facebook page where all the shenanigans happen. And finally, and most importantly, according to her, we link to Madam Stabby Stabs, Instagram, Twitter, and email where you can send all the shenanigans, but You've been warned she might make you cry. And finally, we have our website at anchor.fm slash blasters tech and tech blades. Again, anchor.fm slash blasters dash and dash blades, where for as little as 99 cents a month, uh, you can help keep the lights on. These episodes aren't free to produce, and every penny helps. And if you want to support the show more directly, go over to buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Handley. 
Again, buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it is for the podcast, and I promise I will keep my co-hosts duly caffeinated. They will drink until the java pours out of their ears. Their hair will turn brown, in fact. Uh, That's they good might even, they got all this break. Yeah, they might even start spouting like coffee beans out of their his hair. I don't know. It, it'll get it'll get weird, and I'm here for it. Yeah, save me money. I'm for it. All righty, and thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For my crazy co-host, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. And with that, we're out. Wait for it.